Hello, I am a musician, I'm a composer, and I really like talking about other composers. I find that they can actually be really interesting, and trying to work out their place in history can actually be really cool. So today, I'll be talking about Maurice Ravel, the famous impressionist, actually one of my favourite composers, and what kind of influence he had on the wider world of music. This won't be a particularly theory-heavy video, so if you don't know music theory, that is totally fine, and if you do know music theory, you're a nerd. And unfortunately, while I am talking about a composer and I really would like to be able to play you his music in full, uh, due to the nature of YouTube, I just can't do that because I get like a million copyright strikes immediately. So instead, I've included some links to his compositions in the description for you to listen to. Oh, and by the way, please like the video. Please just do it. Like, it takes like a microsecond. Please just like the video. Just like it. Just <laughs> Maurice Ravel was an early 20th century composer, known primarily nowadays for the development of the Impressionist movement in music, a movement which he helped to advance alongside his older contemporary, Debussy. I will not comment on his name. Born in the Basque region of France, in the town of Cibor in 1875, Ravel was born to artistic parents, who got him into playing and composing from a very young age. And he actually had his first composition performed publicly at just age 14. Girl, if they publicly played the music I wrote at age 14, the audience would probably all get aneurysms. Ravel entered the Paris Conservatoire in 1889 to study piano, having chosen to play Chopin for his entrance examination. Despite Ravel being a fucking nerd who chose, of all composers, to play Chopin, list gang rise up, he actually didn't have a brilliant time at the conservatoire, it seems. His studies and progression were characterised as unspectacular. He didn't stand out, neither as a pianist or student of music theory. He wasn't special in any way. He wasn't a prodigy, and nor was he exceptionally loved by his teachers. Honestly, I'm beginning to see why I relate so hard. It was quickly becoming clear to Ravel and his teachers that, at least for the piano, he would not succeed. If anybody watching this video is a pianist, whether professional or amateur, you will probably know that piano players are absolutely fucking demented. They will strain their minds and their bodies with constant practice in order to be the very best. And if you don't have that drive, especially at a conservatoire, especially in the 19th century, you will be overtaken. And it seems like that happened to Ravel, and he was expelled from the conservatoire at least for the first time in 1895. But all was not lost, because in 1897, two years after he was so unceremoniously yeeted from the music school, he was readmitted. This time, he would study composition under the guide of Ferret, who was basically the only teacher in the entire school who liked him. We have no choice but to stand. Ravel had many critics throughout this period of his early 20s, but perhaps the most outspoken was Lalo. Lalo? Lalo. Lalo. Anyway, he, he didn't seem particularly hot for Ravel, and referred to his music as a clumsy plagiarism of the Russian school, and thought of Ravel as a mediocrely gifted debutant. Girl, I would cry. Despite the deep shade being thrown, Ravel didn't actually seem to be phased by critics, instead choosing to remain distant, satisfied with his own critical eye, which was perhaps the most cutting of all. While Ravel reportedly underwent an immense amount of maturation during this second time at the conservatoire, his tenure was tainted by one particular academic, Théodore Dubois. Real shit lord, he comes up later. Dubois, himself a very conservative man, absolutely despised Ravel, apparently for being outspoken, and both musically and politically progressive. They would clash continuously throughout Ravel's time at the conservatoire. Whether or not due to Dubois' disdain or Lalo's criticism, Ravel ended up, once again, performing unspectacularly, and was kicked out of the conservatoire in 1900. So, you've just spent the best part of a decade at music school, almost half your life, gone, and now you've been kicked out, for the second time. I'd imagine for good this time. What do you do? Get bangs? Change your wardrobe? Shave your pubes? Well, Ravel decided to form a group of like-minded artists named Les Apaches, whose name reportedly compares the group's savage contempt of the status quo with the brutal savagery of Native Americans. Oh, yeah, turn of the century France was a bit problematic. Ignoring the massively racist name, the Les Apache group was, at least for the time, highly artistically progressive. They rallied around artists who were challenging the status quo, almost worshipping or deifying them. Which honestly is not actually that different to Twitter stan culture nowadays. I wonder if there's a Ravel fan cam. Everybody knows that shit. I can be your Lindsay Lohan. I can be Madonna. I can be your Marilyn. 
but eventually, Les Apache would bring Ravel in contact with Debussy. Impressionism was a movement in music started by Debussy in the early 20th century that focused on conjuring a sense of mood and atmosphere rather than potent emotion and expression. Impressionist music, much like Impressionist painting which came a few decades prior, didn't seek to tell big bombastic stories or make the audience gasp and cry, but instead, Impressionism took a cooler approach, seeking to capture just an image of emotion, one which the audience almost feels disassociated from, rather than a detailed musical picture which pulls the audience in. An impression of emotion. See, that's clever, isn't it? So, how does Debussy work into this? And why was he so important for Ravel specifically? Well, despite Ravel not really knowing Debussy all that well, Ravel's fans had actually begun to compare the two's music, and Ravel came across this at least partially through the Les Apache group. Perhaps this was to both their chagrin. I mean, no artist likes to be compared to other contemporaries, but nonetheless, it stuck. Both composers did kinda command a similarish aesthetic, and both their styles definitely had the definitive feeling of emotional distance that characterises Impressionism. Debussy was also actually very supportive of Ravel in his early career. He actually wrote letters of encouragement to Ravel, and I'm sure Ravel's career only benefited from being attached to such an established composer. Ravel, whether he liked it or not, would be an Impressionist. Also, not that I have anything remotely resembling a fan base, but it's not unlike the many comments I get comparing me to ContraPoints and saying I aped her style because I used coloured lights. And at this point, we come to the scandal that marked Ravel's early life, the Prix de Rome. The Prix de Rome for Music was a prestigious French award given out to composers each year for excellence in the art. Past winners included Bizet and Berlioz, but most importantly, Debussy. Ravel applied five times, and with each attempt he submitted excellent work, but he never succeeded past second place. All of this despite having gained quite a reputation as a composer, and having produced work praised by both the public and critics. But it was his last attempt which would ignite a scandal. On Ravel's fifth submission to the Prix de Rome, despite having submitted a very popular piece and having come close to first in the past, Ravel failed to even place. This caused a massive furore, both in the public and in critic circles. Even Lalo, Lilo, Lalo, even Lilo, who had previously called Ravel mediocre and his music clumsy, thought that it was completely unsympathetic and unfair to the young composer that he be dismissed so flippantly. And this is where Théodore Dubois, resident shitlord, would come back into play. Dubois hadn't forgotten his contempt for Ravel and his music, and had blocked all of Ravel's attempts to win the coveted Prix de Rome with his significant power in the Paris Conservatoire. This was compounded by the fact that another teacher, Charles would come into more controversy, as all the finalists just so happened to be his students. Suspicious. The scandal proved too much, and the conservatoire was reorganised and Dubois was forced into early retirement. Ravel never won the prize, but would go on to create some of the most distinctive Impressionist works. The Violin Rhapsody, Tsigane, the ballet Daphne et Chloé, the opening of which is actually one of my favourite pieces of music, and, less fortunately, the horrible steaming pile of shit that is Bolero. While in his early life, Ravel's music was progressive and avant-garde, over time, despite writing beautifully, he began to stagnate. The early 20th century was a period of very fast turnover for music, and other composers started to outpace him. He never became a Théodore Dubois, he was never reactionary or conservative, and he appreciated the cutting edge of music at the time, but he just couldn't keep up. Ravel would die in 1937 due to complications after a car accident five years prior. Ravel in life seemed to be a small, unassuming, five foot three manlet. Man. Is manlet ableist? Not massively charismatic or bombastic, quite unspecial actually, or at least compared to his peacocking contemporaries. His sexuality remains a mystery to this day, having shown very little interest in any gender. He could have been gay and repressed, or he could have been asexual, or he could have just been straight because he visited brothels, but well, that's boring. The only commitment to anyone he seemed to maintain was to his mother, and when she died, he retreated even further into himself. I think in life, the best word to describe Ravel would be distant, emotionally distant, private and disassociated, quite unspectacular, but nonetheless Brilliant. Brilliant. Sir. Brilliant. Brilliant. 
Ravel is perhaps best known for his orchestration. Orchestration is the practice of arranging instruments within a score, so deciding where and when each instrument will be played, and deciding what part of the music that instrument will be playing, so melody, harmony, rhythm, texture, kind of whatever you can think of. Orchestration requires an intimate knowledge of every musical voice in the orchestra, and a deep understanding of how each subsection sounds with one another. To start, a composer will very often have what is called a short score, which is essentially the entire piece of music just written for one or two pianos. Then, in the process of orchestration, the composer will go through the short score, and based on whatever vision they have for the piece, will decide what part gets played by who, for how long, and with what kind of volume, mood, or expression. Ravel is widely considered to be a master of orchestration. His ability to consistently balance every single instrument in the orchestra in a way that is not only technically proficient but also avoids sounding mechanical is actually quite brilliant to listen to. Going back to the Impressionist movement for a second, if you're aiming to capture a sense of mood and ambiance in a piece of music, which is characteristic of Impressionism, orchestration becomes very, very useful. Every instrument in the orchestra has its own personality, its own character to contribute. French horns are smooth and easily blended into the wash of sound, whereas piccolos are piercing and shrill at high registers, and a single one can punch through an entire orchestra despite being about the size of your penis. For an Impressionist, instruments don't just play the melody or the harmony, their characters are themselves tools to convey environment and mood. Take a look at the classic example of Ravel's Levé du Jour from the ballet Daphne et Chloé. So, this piece is conveying the idea of sunrise, and everything attached to a sunrise, essentially the sounds of animals, and the wind, and the weather, alongside the rising sun. First of all, Ravel uses the woodwind section, so flutes, oboes, clarinets, and all that, to convey the sound of wind. He's got all these notes in really fast succession, some of which don't necessarily belong in the key of the piece, and none of which follow any distinct rhythm. Much like in this passage, the weather doesn't care about rhythm, and it doesn't care about key, it just exists. And so the woodwind captures this feeling of slightly buffeting wind, without sounding too clashing as to draw attention. Later on, the choir comes in, singing the distinctive main theme of the entire ballet. Its purpose is more abstract than something concrete like birdsong or wind, but I think it's conveying a feeling of mystery. It sometimes clashes with the other sounds, and perhaps evokes the feelings and wonder inside the characters on stage, rather than the outside environment. All these elements, all these textures and emotions, come together at the climax in a vibrant wash of sound. You've got all these different musical personalities all vying for attention, and if any two of them were played on top of each other, it might sound clashing, but playing them all at once balances it all out. And, in Ravel fashion, it's all supported by the string section, which, like the bread of a sandwich, glues all the sounds together. Wait, that's not what bread does. Who the fuck wrote this script? This is quite a simple example, but I think it demonstrates my point quite well. Ravel was a master of Impressionist orchestration, and his devotion to every single instrument in the orchestra was absolutely mad. There's like 25 different voices going on all at the same time, and he manages to balance them all perfectly without any one dominating. It's really cool. His work would go on to be a benchmark, a gold standard for film music, opera, ballet, even to this day. I think Ravel's, and perhaps more widely Impressionism's, approach to emotion is particularly relevant today. Impressionism in music means a lot of things, but as I've said before, perhaps the most important characteristic of the movement is emotional distance or detachment. The listener isn't meant to empathise with the music directly or put themselves into the story. Instead, it should feel like you're watching from afar, only able to get an impression of what's going on. Impressionism's cooler approach to emotion came as a response to the romantic period which came before it, a period of intrigue, scandal, and high-octane melodrama, which we clearly haven't yet managed to get rid of. 
coming out of Romanticism, people in the early 20th century wanted something new. The avant-garde was searching for new emotion. They wanted something detached, something cold and distant, as opposed to fiery and personal. And they received, of many things, Impressionism. In today's world, where everybody does seem to be getting further and further apart, and where the world does feel cold and distant, Ravel's music kind of acts like a commentary. Impressionism seeks to capture the feeling of being outside looking in, and if that doesn't perfectly capture the human condition in 2020, then I literally don't know what does. Everyone observes everyone else. I can open up my phone and find anybody's life and just watch it from afar. Even you, watching me from the screen. Maybe you think you know who I am, or that you can tell my personality by just watching me. But in truth, you can't. Nobody can. As an observer, you can only get an impression of what it's like to truly know me. All of this is Impressionism, just packaged differently. And, um, with a cute thumbnail. Oh. Ravel wasn't a particularly revolutionary composer. He wasn't massively adventurous or academic. And while the early 20th century is known as one of the most historically tumultuous and subversive periods for music, he worked firmly throughout within already established musical structures. He wasn't Stravinsky, who had managed to revolutionize ballet decades earlier with his new approach to rhythmic structure, nor was he Schoenberg, who basically invented a whole new region of music. But despite this, I think Ravel is still very important. Not only only was he a master of his craft, he was also a master of mood. His music can transport you to virtually any environment, any scene or tableau, and have you, as the audience member, entranced. Happily watching things unfold from a distance, separate from the scene, but still able to feel the ambiance. A hidden observer. So, I've basically just spent the best part of, like, 20 minutes or however long this video is, talking about some random composer you've probably never heard of and probably don't give a shit about. So, why? Why do I care about Ravel and why am I telling you his story? Well, very often when people cover historical figures, especially on YouTube, creators will quite naturally gravitate towards telling the stories of the most prominent figures. People who lived like the most crazy lives or changed history in like a crazy way. But I don't want to do that. I want to talk about the smaller people. History is filled to the brim with artists and composers that aren't remembered nearly as well as the greats like Mozart or Debussy. Or Debussy? And yet every single one of those artists has a sphere of influence and a very interesting story to tell. As a character, I think Ravel specifically captures my attention because he wasn't special. He wasn't born a prodigy or an icon. In life, he eventually did become very famous, and to anyone familiar with classical music, Ravel is actually very, very well known. But it seems that the course of history has decided that other composers, like his friend Debussy, were much more influential. And maybe that's true. I mean, he was, at least compared to his contemporaries, unspectacular. I mean, the man was five foot three. But not only is that really relatable, not to me, I'm six foot one, but yeah. It's also really important in its own way. Everybody's life has a story that can be interesting, no matter how unspecial history might consider you. And if you've ever delved into Stan Twitter, you would see that even to this day, we continue to put too much stock into icons and individuals. I'm looking at you, little monsters. Chromatical flopped, okay, just let it go. Ravel was a master of his craft. Perhaps he was unadventurous, but that's all right. In art, we will always need revolutionaries, people to push the boundary but we also need people that can perfect what's already been done. So, 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 congratulations, you have finished the video. You are now 20 minutes closer to death. Like the video, subscribe, uh, I don't care, but most importantly, please click the bell. I don't want you missing out on all my lovely videos. Oh yeah, I've also got Patreon, so, um, give me your money. Love you.